Good morning, church. Um, I'll just, since I'm the clerk, I will announce the second reading of the membership transfer out request for Sandro Jimenez to the Carson Spanish SDA Church in Carson, California. He moved, and we're glad we, he has a new church home. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Uh, as a reminder, you can uh, do your tithes and offerings here at the church. There's a little church building at the back of the sanctuary, and there are tithe envelopes if you need to mark down what it's for. You can also give online or mail it to us at the Madison Community Seventh-day Adventist Church, 1926 Elko Lane, uh, Madison, Wisconsin, 537 04. Okay, just putting that out there. Um, so today's song service is a little new experience for us. We have used to do this when we didn't have a pianist, but we haven't done it in a long time because we've always been able to have someone here, especially after Poit events came. I've got feedback, Doug. Uh, and we have Eldine and Pastor, you know, helping with the music three out of the four Sabbaths when we have a four Sabbath month. And anyway, this is a fifth Sabbath and we didn't have a pianist. So I'm grateful for my two counterparts up here willing to come in and we're singing the CDs, which we used to do in the past. So, um, and he, these are songs that all you should all be familiar with. The first one is Shine Jesus Shine. Okay, Doug, just start it over. We got it. <laughs> so the first one we're singing is As the Deer Panted for the Water.
Father's glory, play, Spirit, play, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy, send forth your word, Lord. Absolutely every day. The next one is actually a hymn. Um, if you're following along online, it's number 462 in the hymnal. Um, but the words will be on the screen as well. And, um, you know, we can proclaim the fact that Jesus loves us to the world around us by actual words, but also by our actions. And so when we shine for Jesus, that is something that is a, a positive message to those who come in contact. And I think it's really easy to get caught up in some of the pressures of the world and get distracted and I think Bruce's sermon will focus on one of one of the ways that we can get distracted but um, our lives should be proclaiming that we have the blessed assurance that Jesus loves us and that he can love the other ones
the deer and I invite you to stand for this one um, you know like I said it's easy to get distracted by the world and Jesus wants us to long after him just like a deer wandering in the wilderness have a special music this Sabbath thanks to Yesenia Martig who came in and said hey you want a special music and I said of course so anyway Yesenia thank you so much thank you. happy Sabbath family <laughs> we are a family in all this world <laughs>
thank you, Sinya, for sharing that music with us. Wasn't that wonderful, special this morning? Let's bow our heads for just a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we just want to uh, invite you into our sanctuary, more importantly, into our hearts this morning. We ask through your Holy Spirit that you will be able to come and abide with us today. We want to remember our pastor and uh, Eldine as they're worshiping in another church. He's presenting a message at this time. We pray that you'll be with him and continue to bless him in the work that he does. We pray for each member here, whether they're online or in person, our visitors. You know the particular wants and desires that we have, the needs that we have. We ask, Lord, that you would work in your way and that you would provide for our necessities, for our needs. And we ask, Lord, to be with those that are suffering. We think of some of the parts of the world today. We think of Ukraine where the uh, fighting is still going on. We think of the terrible flooding that we saw in Kentucky this past week. We pray also uh, for them, Father. And we ask for any here that may be suffering under uh, the affliction of Satan. We pray that you will lighten their burdens as only you can. We ask this in thy loving name, amen. Well, I wanna welcome you to our worship hour this morning. We're going to share a, a message with you. It's entitled, The Church's Greatest Sin. Have you ever wondered what that, what that may be? The greatest sin in the church. Well, I want to give you some comfort to begin with. It's not murder. It's not rape, it's not selling drugs on the street corner, it's not robbing banks or, or stealing cars. No Hollywood director would ever make a movie about the greatest sin in the church because there's not enough sexual contents, there's not enough violence or killing or murder to make it profitable for a Hollywood director to make a movie about it. But what is the greatest sin in the church? We're going to take a look at that this morning. I'm going to just say one real quick short prayer. Father in heaven, again, we just ask that your Holy Spirit fills our heart. Be with me this morning as I open your word and attempt to share here. We pray that you will control my thoughts, my mind, the words that come from my lips, and that they will be clear and, and present an understandable message this morning for each individual here. So we're going to begin with our first text. We're going to go to Luke this morning, 12, and it is verse 15. And Jesus tells us, names for us, the sin. Luke 12, 15. It says, and he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one, one's life does not consist of the abundance of the things that he possesses. Jesus names a sin, he calls it covetousness. Well, just because he names it, how do we know that's the most common, the most prevalent sin? I want to share with you from the spirit of prophecy. We'll give several quotes from Sister White this morning. Testimonies, volume 5, she says this, selfishness the sin of the world has become the prevailing sin of the church. And then in Testimonies, Volume 1, she writes, the greatest sin which now exists in the church is covetousness. God frowns upon his professed people for their selfishness. Selfishness. Those words are used interchangeably, covetousness and, and, uh, and selfishness. Someone could say, well, at least it's not murder, at least it's not rape, at least it's not bank robbery. We, we ought to be happy about that. But here's what it says in Steps to Christ, page 17. The drunkard is despised and told that his sin will keep him out of heaven, while pride, selfishness, and covetousness too often go unrebuked. But these are the sins that are especially offensive to God for they are contrary to the benevolence of his character and to the unselfish love, which is the very atmosphere of the unfallen universe. So while we may not consider selfishness or covetousness to be a terrible, gross sin, 
She says it's especially uh, uncomfortable for God because it goes against his very against his very nature. Now, unfortunately, we live in a very materialistic world. It's probably never been as bad as it is today. Madison Avenue spends hundreds of billions of dollars every year on advertising. They want you to believe that whatever you have is not good enough, that you deserve something that's bigger, something that's newer, something that's more expensive and better than you currently have. And that doesn't matter whether we're talking about your home or your car or your clothes or your furniture or where you take a vacation. Whatever you have, you should get bigger and better and newer and more expensive. We live in a very materialistic world. We have a saying that says the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. And we have a saying that says we need to try to keep up with the Joneses. And because of those concepts, we are always sort of uh, struggling against covetousness and selfishness in our, in our lives. There are two pair of words that are very good that we should be practicing. And there are two pair of words that are very bad that we want to get away from and shun. The good words that we want to put into our lives are self-control and self-denial. We want to be practicing self-control and self-denial. The two bad words, of course, are covetousness and selfishness. We want to be getting those, getting those out of our lives. I want to share with you from, again, from the spirit of prophecy. It says, their worship of money, houses, and lands will mark them as idolaters and apostates. All selfishness is covetousness and is therefore idolatry. Now that's another thought, isn't it? Covetousness and selfishness, but then she says also that is, could be called idolatry. Now when we think of idolatry, we say, well, idolatry is falling down and worshiping an idol. That's breaking a commandment of God. But how is covetousness and selfishness idolatry? Well, let me give you the definition. Idolatry is the worship of idols. That's the one we're familiar with. But it is also can be defined as blind adoration, reverence, or devotion. Anything that we have, any material thing, if it takes the place of God, or if it shortens our time that we spend with God, you know, if we're, if we're so busy driving our $100,000 sports car that we never can read our Bible, well then that's become an idol in our, in our lives. It's pushing God out. It's becoming something that's more important to us than what he is. So we have covetousness, selfishness, which is idolatry. Well, none of us would bow down to an idol. We, we know what happened, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? They, they were strong, they didn't bow down to any idol, and we wouldn't do that, but we have to be careful because we could let the material things sort of swamp us, overcome us, and pull us away from our relationship with the Lord. Let's go to Colossians 3 in the Bible. Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to look at 5 and 6 are the verses. Colossians 3, 5 and 6. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. In other words, get rid of these. Fornication, uncleanliness, passions, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Now, we don't want the wrath of God on us. And he says that covetousness is, is really idolatry. Well, how does the commandment read? Let's go to Exodus chapter 20. Let's read that commandment, the one that deals with covetousness. It's the last commandment, commandment number 10. So Exodus 20, 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, 
You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And of course, depending on your sex, you should not cover your, your neighbor's husband, right? Depending on who you are. Nor his male servant, his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. So if we were to put that into more probably our language, we would say don't cover, covet his house, don't covet his wife or husband, depending on who you are. Don't, cover his, don't covet his automobile, his snowmobile, his motorcycle, his boat, his ATV. Don't, cover, don't covet the things that are your, your neighbors. Now, Paul struggled with covetousness. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. You know, Paul is the one who says in the Bible, I am blameless. I'm a Pharisee among the Pharisees. I'm a Hebrew among the Hebrews. Outwardly, I do everything correct. I am a, a pillar. I am a great example of what a human being should be. But when we go to Romans 7, verse 7, it says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. You see, the first nine commandments are the ones that we do outwardly, and everybody can tell whether we're keeping them or not. We get to the tenth commandment, that's the one that you do in your heart, and nobody can tell whether you're doing it or not. Only God can know if, if you're, you're coveting. Paul says, you know, I thought I was living a pretty good life, but then I saw the 10th commandment, which says, thou shalt not covet. And he said, wow, I'm in big trouble. Verse 9, Ro or of uh, Romans 7, verse 9. I was alive once without the law. When the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. He says, when I realized about the spiritual side of the law, and I realized that coveting was wrong. He says, I was reminded of the sin that was in my heart, and I died. The, re the wages of sin is death, right? The wages of sin is death. He realized he was in big, he was in big trouble. Coveting is done inside, and no one but God can read our, read our hearts. Let's look at a story in the Bible of an individual who coveted. Let's see how it turned out for him. Let's go to Joshua 7 this morning. Joshua 7. We'll look at a person who coveted and we'll see how that, how that panned out for them. Now let me set the stage before we read the verses. Israel had crossed over the Jordan River. Moses had died. Joshua was leading the people. They had marched around the city of Jericho for seven days they blew the trumpets, they shouted, the walls fell down in this big city of Jericho. They went in and they captured the city, but they were told beforehand, don't take any material things out of the city, it's all cursed. If you take it out, you're going to bring a curse upon yourself, and you're going to bring a curse upon the people of Israel. So leave everything in the city. Don't take any money, don't take any clothes, don't take any furniture, don't take anything out of the city of Jericho. So they did, they did that. They conquered the city of Jericho. Then they went to take on a very small city called Ai, and Israel got defeated. And they thought, how, how did this happen? How did we get defeated? We, we just conquered a big city, and now we're going to take on a little one, and now we lost. And God said, you know, there's sin in the camp. He said to Joshua, you have sin in the camp. Somebody did something I told them not to do. So they begin to uh, eliminate the people. They started going tribe by tribe. Then they started going uh, family by family. Then they started going household by household. And finally, man by man, they came before uh, Joshua. And finally, the Lord said, that's the guy right there that did it. I don't know how long this took. It probably took several hours to go through everybody and to figure out who it was. But now we find the man, and what is his name? His name is Achan, who has done this. So let's read verses 20 and 21. And Achan answered Joshua, 
said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. I saw among the spoils, that's the spoils of Jericho, a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them. I took them. And they, they are in, hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. He says, you got me. I'm the one who took the stuff I wasn't supposed to take. I buried it in the ground in the middle of my tent. Let's go to Joshua 7, 24 and 25. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold. Those are the three things he had stolen. But listen what else they took. His sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had, they brought them to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones. They buried them, uh, they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Didn't come out very well for him, did he? Not only was he killed, but his children were killed with him, and everything that he had was taken and, and burned up and destroyed. Now, you know, the first time I read this, I thought, wow, that's kind of tough. I mean, the children, now we don't know how old his children were. Were they 8, 10, 12, or were they 30 years old? We, we really don't know. But he was a soldier, so I'm going to guess he wasn't 90. You know, I'm guessing he was younger as opposed to older, and if he was younger, that means his children were younger. And I thought, wow, the kids had to be executed for this? For what Dad did? That sounds a little tough. But then I got thinking, you know, if you want to hide something in your house, if you buy somebody a Christmas present and you want to hide it, you could take it up to the attic, or you could put it in a closet, you could take it out in a garage, you could take it down in the basement. But when you live in a tent, you haven't got any of those things. So he had to hide it in the ground. And you know how kids are. They're full of questions. And I can imagine when he started digging the hole, the kids were there, Dad, what are you digging a hole for? Dad, where'd you get that gold? Dad, where'd you get that silver? Dad, where'd all these good, nice clothes come from? Dad, why are you hiding them in the ground? What's the matter, Dad? I can just imagine his kids peppered him with questions and they knew what was hap or what he had done. And so when they started eliminating tribes, families, households, and they spent hours going through the different groups of people in the Israelite camp, at any time during those hours of time, his kids could have stepped up and said, hey, dad did it, our dad did it, it's, it's in our tent. Dad, give yourself up. Dad, they're gonna find out. Dad, you're the guilty one. But apparently they kept silence. They didn't want their dad to get caught. That's the only thing I can, I can think of. But it didn't, it didn't end well for him. Sister White tells us there's three things that money's good for. Three things. Number one, it's good to advance God's cause. We call that tithes and offerings. We support the work, the church. Number two, it pays our bills, the necessities of life. You know, you have to have a roof over your head. We need transportation. We need heat. We need electricity, we need food, we need clothes. The necessities of life. So it advances God's cause. It pays our bills and necessities. The third thing that money does is we can use it to help relieve human suffering, she says. If you've paid your bills, if you've paid your tithe and your offerings and there's money left over, a good thing to do is to use it for some charity or use it to help somebody in some way. Maybe you can buy somebody a... a some groceries, maybe you can drive somebody to the doctor, maybe you can use some charitable thing with money. So those are the three main things it's good for, paying your bills, advancing God's cause, relieving human suffering. Will there be any rich people in heaven? Yes, but not too many. There will be some rich people in heaven, who might they be? Well, we think Abraham will be there, Isaac will be there, Jacob will be there. 
King David will be there. Solomon will be there. Job will be there. So there will be some really rich people in heaven. But they will be the minority. They will not be the majority of people in heaven. Most of the people in heaven will have come from the poor classes on this earth. What are the chances that a rich person can get to heaven? Let's go to Matthew 19 this morning. Jesus kind of tells us what the odds are that you can make it to heaven and be filthy rich here on this earth. I mean, there'll be a few people, but believe me, they, they will be the minority. Jesus kind of lays out the odds. Matthew 19, 23 and 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. So the odds are not too good, right? Not very good odds that you're going to be filthy rich on this earth and you're still going to end up with eternal life. There'll be a few, but don't, don't bank on that happening. Years ago, somebody asked Mr. Rockefeller, who was one of the richest Americans at the time, multimillionaire, they asked him, how much money is enough money? He replied, a little more than I have. A little more than I have. It's always a little bit more for a selfish, greedy person. Always have to have just a little bit more. Never quite, never quite satisfied. We should never forget. Well, that's a nice way to start a sentence, right? We should never forget. We are placed on trial in this earth to determine our fitness for the future life. None can enter heaven whose characters are defiled by the foul blot of selfishness. Therefore, God tests us here by committing to us material possessions that by our use of these we may show whether we can be entrusted with eternal riches. And then she writes a little later, every selfish, covetous person will fall out by the way. All such people will be sifted out from among God's people. Everyone will be sifted out. Everyone will fall by the way if you're practicing covetousness and, and selfishness. Two men were talking one time. One of them was very rich. He was a successful businessman. He said, I've never needed God for anything in my life. Everything I've gotten, I've gotten by the sweat of my own brow. I've gotten it by the effort of my own two hands. I'm a self-made man. I've never gotten anything from God and I don't need him. His friend replied, I'm glad to hear you don't need God. That saves God the embarrassment of explaining what went wrong. Ouch. Ouch, that's kind of a slam, isn't it? Let's go to Psalms 119 this morning. Longest, biggest, uh, chapter in the Bible, right? Psalms 119 and verse 36 and 37. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn my eyes away from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. We don't want to get caught up with worthless things. You know what we call worthless things today? We call it stuff, stuff. And you wanna know when you find out how much stuff you have, you buy a new house or you move. That's when you find out how much stuff you got. I mean, you try to move and oh, where'd all this stuff come from? How'd I get all this stuff? I thought I was you know, living uh, with self-control and uh, all of a sudden, whoa, box after box after box of stuff that we have. But it says, turn us away from covetousness. Don't get us tied up buying lots of worthless, lots of worthless things. Let's look at another story in the Bible of someone who was coveting. It didn't work out very good for Achan. He ended up getting stoned 
along with his, his children. doesn't mention his wife. I don't know what happened there, but anyway. Let's look at another one. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 5. Another person who was coveting. Let's see how it, how it worked out for them. 2 Kings chapter 5. Now, again, let me set the, let me set the uh, story here for you. Naaman was a general in the Syrian army, but he had leprosy, a terminal disease. He had a little slave girl who they had captured from Israel, and she said to her master, Naaman, she said, you know, if you could go visit the prophet Elisha, Elisha could, could pray to his God, and you could be healed of leprosy. Well, you know, if you're terminally ill, you're pretty well willing to try things. And so he decided he would go there. So let's go to 2 Kings chapter 5 and beginning in verse 5. And the king of Syria said, Go now, I'll send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed, that's Naaman. He took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Now in my Bible, if you add up the silver and the gold, and I don't know how accurate this is, but it says that, that he took 900 pounds of money. 900 pounds of money with him, plus remnant, and if he was healed, he was gonna give this to Elisha. That was gonna be his payment for, for healing him, all right? So you know the story, he went to Elisha and Elisha sent out his servant and his servant said you have to go and dip in the Jordan River seven times and you'll be healed. And Naaman basically said, I'm not gonna go in that old swamp mud hole. I'm not gonna go in that dirty polluted Jordan River. I've got cleaner rivers back in Syria. I'll go back there and I'll wash. I'm not gonna do it. And he started back for home but the uh, servants, and the uh, men in his army that were with him, I mean, he had 900 pounds of money, you know, you just don't walk around with that and flash that. Undoubtedly, he had a lot of guards with him. They kind of pulled him inside and said, listen, why do you want to go back to Syria? You're terminally ill. If, if this works, you can be healed, but if it doesn't work, you're no worse off. Do you want to just go home and die? Does that make any sense to you? And Naaman you know, thought it over and figured, that sounds pretty logical. So he went ahead and he dipped seven times in the Jordan River. Did he get healed? Well, he got healed, right? You know the story, right? He dipped seven times in the Jordan River. He came up the seventh time and his leprosy was gone. He was, he was healed. So he thought, wow, this worked. I, I, I'm healed. So he went back to see the prophet Elisha. So let's pick this, let's pick this story up in the... Uh, 2 Kings 5, 15. 2 Kings 5, verse 15. And he returned to the man of God. So he went back to the prophet Elisha. He and all his aides, because he needed a lot of people to carry 900 pounds of money around, he came and stood before him and said, Indeed, now I know there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. He says, I brought you 900 pounds of money. I brought you many changes of clothing. Take a gift from me. Verse 16, but he said, this is Elisha, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. He urged him to take it, but he refused. Why do you think that was? Why didn't Elisha take the money? He didn't take it because he didn't want Naaman to think that you could bribe God, that you could pay God and then get something for him. Do we have any story in the Bible where somebody paid Jesus to work a miracle for him? No, no. He wanted, Elisha wanted to make sure that Naaman knew that God's gifts are free, right? The wages of sins are death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's free, so you can't buy it. You, you can't purchase God's 
grace or God's love. And he wanted to make sure that Naaman knew this. And so Naaman said, well, all right, you're not going to take any money or any clothes. I'll, I'll go home, but thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm healed. And so he started home. But now, here comes the rest of the story. Let's go to verse 20. But Gehazi, who was the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Look, my master has spared Naaman the Syrian while not receiving from his hands what he brought. But as the Lord lives, I'll run after him and I'll take something from him. The servant Gehazi thought, man, this is more money than I'll ever make in my life. If, if you would have took this, we could have bought a new house. We could have bought a farm. We could have bought a lot of animals. I wouldn't have to be a servant anymore. I could have servants under me. You, you let him walk away and you didn't take anything. I'll go get something for myself. So he decides to go after him. Go to verse 22, 2 Kings 5, 22. And he said, all is well, my master. Now he tells a lie. My master sent me. He runs him down. He runs Naaman down on the road. You know, maybe he had to go two, three miles. He ran, caught him, ran up to him. He says, all is well. My master has sent me, saying, indeed, just now, Two men from the sons of the prophets have come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give me a talent of silver and two changes of garments. He told a lie. Nobody showed up, but he told this to, uh, to Naaman. So Naaman said, please, take two talents. He offered him twice as much. He wanted one talent. He said, take two talents. And he urged him, and he bound two talents of silver and two bags two changes of garments, and he handed them to two of his servants. He said, I'm going to send two of my servants back with you, back to Elisha's house, because you can't carry all this money yourself. So there was two talents of silver, a lot of twos there, two talents of silver went in two bags, two changes of clothes, and then two servants were going to carry it all back. They carried, and, and they carried them on ahead of him. When he came to the citadel, he took them from their hands, stored them away in the house. Then he let the men go, and they departed. So he hid, because he knew Elisha would be upset with him, so he hid his ill-gotten gains. Verse 25, now he went in and stood before his master Elisha, and Elisha said to him, where did you go, Gehazi? And he said, your servant did not go anywhere. Now he told the second lie. Now, if you're, you should never lie, okay? Lying's not good, you should never lie. But my advice is, if you are gonna lie, don't do it, but if you are going to, don't lie to a prophet of God. I mean, this guy is gonna read you like an open book. You know what I mean? Lie to somebody who might be more gullible. Don't, don't do that, that's really dumb. But anyway, he says, uh, I didn't go anywhere. Now, I don't know whether God gave Elisha a vision or whether he somehow let the scenes come before his eyes. I'm not sure how he did that. But listen to what happens in verse 26. Then he said to him, did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? In other words, I saw you when you were there. It is... Is it time to receive money and to take clothes? And then he begins to tell uh, Gehazi everything that he was going to buy with that ill-gotten gains. Is it time to receive clothing, olive groves, vineyards, sheep, oxen, male servants, female servants? You thought you were going to get all that with, that with that money. But it's not going to work out. Verse 27. Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out from his presence, leprous, as white as snow. Now, God can, when God takes away our sins, we hope he, makes them, he can make them as white as snow, right? But we don't want to be white as snow because we have leprosy. That's not good. So how did it work out for Gehazi? Well, when he went in to see to uh, see his master when he went in to see Elisha. He was healthy and he was wealthy. When he came out, 
he still had his wealth, apparently. We don't, the Bible doesn't say that Elijah took away his wealth. He still had his wealth. But when he came out, he had stage four leprosy. He was terminally, terminally ill with leprosy. No cure going to come for him. And then it's going to pass on to his family. So he didn't do too good that day, did he? Achan didn't do too good. He got killed and his family. And this man became terminally ill, and it's going to pass on to his family. He still had his wealth, but now he was dying. He was dying. Whether he lived six months or one year or two years, we don't know. But his life was cut. His life was cut short because he coveted. He wanted those things. So, in closing, how do we avoid covetousness and selfishness? What do we do? Well, number one, we need to get our priorities straight. We live in a very materialistic world, but we need to get our priorities straight. Let's go to Matthew 6, 33. Matthew 6, 33. Here's the priority. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Put God first in our lives. Make sure he's first. That's top priority. You know, Jesus tells us in the book of John, he's going to prepare mansions for us in heaven. That's one of the things he's doing. But probably the bigger question is, while he's preparing mansions for us in heaven, are we letting the Holy Spirit prepare our hearts here on earth so we can someday inhabit those mansions? Are we letting Jesus change us and mold us into the type of people that can inhabit those mansions in heaven someday? 1 Timothy 6 this morning. What can we do to avoid covetousness? 1 Timothy 6. We want to get our priorities straight. We want to put God first. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8, now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Paul says, you know, I, I try to live content in life. You know, if we have, when we think about it really, if you have a roof over your head, if you have a furnace that works in the winter time and you have air conditioning that works this time of the year, if you have a dependable vehicle, if you have food and clothing and electricity, be content. You know, you, you don't need a $50,000 speedboat. You don't need a $100,000 sports car. We don't need, need to live in a $2 million mansion. But be, be content, Paul says, with what you have if you have the basics in life. We want to practice self-control. We want to practice self-denial. Those are the two good words in our purchasing, our purchasing habit. Our last text this morning, Matthew 16. We're looking at what we can do to avoid covetousness. So, be, be content. Matthew 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. That's self-denial. Take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whosoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And that's pretty, pretty basic, isn't it? What if we gained the whole world, but we lost out on heaven? What have we really, what have we really gained ultimately? We're, we're going to end up being the biggest loser. If we, lose, if we lose eternal life. If we don't have eternal life, if we don't have Jesus, then really, what, what do we, what do we have? We don't really have much, do we, in this world? All right, there's going to be a closing hymn, I believe, Amazing Grace. I think our singers are coming up. If you want to stand to sing along with them in this closing hymn,
heaven, we just want to thank you, Lord, for bringing us together for this beautiful Sabbath day. We're thankful, Lord, for the song that we just sang, Amazing Grace. We've learned that your uh, grace, your miracles, your blessings, they cannot be purchased, they cannot be bought with material things, but they are free gifts to each one of us. We pray, Lord, that each one here daily opens our hearts, opens our minds, is receptive to an outpouring of your Holy Spirit, and that as time goes on, that you change us, you give us the fruits of the Spirit, the love, the joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Give us those gifts and make us into the men and women and children that can inhabit the earth made new someday. And we look forward to your soon second coming when we will hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Be with us now and protect us as we travel to our different destinations. And may we let our light shine and witness for you when opportunity presents. In thy name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you for coming and have a good, safe week.